So far, all of our investigations into the relationship between flux and charge have been for one single point charge, but unfortunately, that isn't going to get us very far. So we now need to generalize to think about multiple point charges. And once we think about multiple point charges, we know that we can build up any continuous charge distribution from, in fact, uh, just point charges. So the argument will be for multiple discrete point charges, but we could build, for instance, a line of charge, a cylinder of charge, a sheet of charge out of individual point charges. So the other thing to think about um, that isn't, is going to be a little bit uh, jumped over here, but again, it's really important, is whether those charges are inside or outside. And so here we have some charges that are outside and some that are in fact inside. So we have to think about both of them. So far we did the situation where we considered one point charge inside or one point charge outside and now we need to add it all together. So if you feel like you don't understand those single point charge examples, um, the example I'm going to do here, the calculation I'm going to do here is probably going to go too fast for you. So please make sure that you understand the arguments for the flux from a, a single point charge inside versus outside our surface. And again, it also generalizes to pieces or entirety of charge distributions that are inside or outside of our surfaces. So we are using superposition here, and that's a fancy physics word for adding. And so if we think about all of the electric fields from all of those different charges, whatever they are, that at every single point, you just have some total electric field. And so in the end, our flux is just going to add. And the reason is because electric fields just add. And that might not seem like that surprising or important of a result, but it's really important. There are situations in physics and engineering where things don't add, and you typically don't meet them in intro physics because they're really, really hard to work with and usually give you chaotic systems. So we can add up all of our electric fields at a given point. And again, we're going to integrate over all of the points. And you can add up however many electric fields you want from however many point charges you have. So there could almost be a whole other integral here if you had a charge distribution, but we're not going to think about that yet. So we just have a bunch of different electric fields from our bunch of different point charges. Now then, if we have this term, which is dot product with our dA, and then the second term dot product with our dA, once you have a bunch of added terms inside an integral, you can break each one out into an integral, right? So this is just a calculus property, that I have the integral of A plus B, well, that could just be the integral of A plus the integral of B. So now we have a bunch of integrals that are added, yay. So then what? Well, now we evaluate each integral. But notice that this is just the definition of the flux from charge one, as if there was nothing else there. So this is how we've gone from getting from some sort of complicated, I don't know what to do uh, flux to argue that the flux you actually get on the surface is going to be the sum of the fluxes from each charge. So if we had our surface here, and for instance, we had Q1 on the inside, we have another charge on the inside, which is Q2, and then maybe say Q3 was on the outside, we would then look at each of these fluxes and say, hey, we've already learned something pretty important, that flux 1 is just going to be Q1 over epsilon naught. Flux 2 is just going to be Q2 over epsilon naught, because two videos ago we showed that your flux is actually independent of the shape, so it doesn't matter what our shape is. Then Q3, oh, that's outside of our shape. That guy's zero, right? That was in the last video. So we now see that this is going to simplify a little bit so that the only thing that contributes is actually the charge that's on the inside. The charges on the outside don't contribute. So you just get to add up all of the charge on the inside and divide that by epsilon naught. So this is in fact Gauss's law. Now I'll say I, I write Gauss's law this way, the book writes it that way, I don't know, that seems like way too many S's and English is a hard language, so if this one isn't right I like it better and I'm just okay to be wrong. So our flux from 
any type of charge distribution is just the amount of charge that you have inside your closed surface divided by epsilon naught. So uh, this is really helpful. This is going to be something we use in a few different ways. And in the next video, I'll talk a little bit about what we might do with this. And then in the whole next section of this chapter, there will be some examples. Now, there's a note I want to make here, especially if you're looking at other online resources. There's an entirely different way to write Gauss's law that involves divergence. And if you say, oh, I don't even know what divergence is, well, that's like when you have, you know, something like that. And if you've had multivariable calculus, you might know what that is. Um, now, this other way to write Gauss's law is used in more advanced physics. And when we write Maxwell's equations, as I've mentioned before, Gauss's law appears there. There's an integral form, and then there's what I would call kind of a, diver a, a derivative form. So recognize that if you just start Googling Gauss's law, you're going to see some stuff that looks very different than this. but for our intro physics class, this is the level that we need. So your flux, which is defined as this, which we're frequently going to use, is however much charge is inside your surface divided by epsilon naught.